are we? Um, good morning, good morning. <coughs> Look at this, I think I got the camera a little bit tilted. Our rocket ship, our floater is tilted. It's going to crash. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> the floater is off to one side. Sorry about that. Uh, I moved the camera a little bit from its normal position today. There was two beer cans in the way. Actually, the camera is a bit higher than it normally is. There's actually two of those beer, uh, what are they called? They're not cans. Tons? I forget what they're called, those beer things. So I moved the camera up and out a little bit to try and keep out of the way of those beer things, and I got it a little bit crooked, and the, our rocket today is uh, headed for disaster. Kegs, kegs. <laughs> details, details. <laughs> I think ton is a word, T-U-N. I'm not sure the difference, a beer keg and a beer ton. Good morning, gang. Hello, hello, hello. Okay, Monday morning, here we are. Another beautiful, beautiful day. At the pool today, they had the roof open. I knew it was an openable roof, but I've never seen it like this. I started there last November, and I guess that was the end of that for the year. And I was curious if they ever did open it. I'd never seen it open, but uh, today it was open. One twin. So I was asking, what cam is it? You mean the camera outside? It's just a handy cam. I, I forget. It's a JVC. There's the other one. Wait for me. <laughs> Wait for me. <laughs> so... <laughs> It's just a standard handy cam. Oh, no, we use a normal handy cam instead of a, a, a more whatever. So it focuses. It will just focus automatically all during the day without me having to worry about where it's focused to. So, Okay, tonight, today we're going, we finished our, well, we haven't finished it, but for the moment we finished our monkey print. That's gone upstairs, and there will be some test printing happening on that hopefully this week. After test printing, I will need at least one and perhaps two more blocks. I couldn't carve them yet because we need data from the printing of the first blocks. So that job is in abeyance right now. So on the TV block is here because I was doing Chiritori. I did Great Wave Chiritori all day yesterday. All day yesterday. So that's what this was here for as a base. We're not going to use it today. Today we are starting a new project. Let me clean up the stuff here just a sec. There's the leftover waves, the ones that didn't make it through. We have rather a lot this time. These are the ones that didn't make it. Okay, before we start, or should we save this for the show and tell time? Let's save it. The the Senshaft prints from the last show and tell, they are all safely extracted, and we'll look at them at show and tell time, if I remember, or if you remind me. Because of no, this time it's different. I have to be careful what I say here. The, the printing of the Great Wave this time around was the first batch ever printed by Suga-san. Suga-san is one, one of our top guns, but our, our batch of blocks, our block set for the Great Wave is a kind of a different weird block set. If you saw the videos, you know what it is. It's, part of it is, is Mukuita solid wood, and part of them are plywood. And that means the, the registration issues are fiercely difficult. So you've got to get used to that block set. You've got to know how to do it. So Subisan took it this time on the understanding that it would be a test. She would learn how to use that block set. There would be a lot of stuff that didn't actually make it through. And we would pay her for that just for experience and then pay her the real fee for the prints that were made. And so it happened. We got about 40 good ones and we got about 20 that were practice. And they will never see the light of day. But uh, there we have it. So. No, nothing to do with sizing. These were sized, yeah, these were sized before I left. So she did these prints. Actually, they've been sitting on my desk here waiting for me to get back. She did these back in the beginning of April, I guess. And in fact, the next batch is now already underway. No, for a trial run normally, it wouldn't be that many bad ones. But as I said, this block set is a really, really, really difficult block set. So there's no, 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 no way around it. She did a very, very good job. Okay, today's job, the next job, it's related to this. You know what this print is. You've seen it. It's been in our catalog for years. I hinted about this the other day, and I think some people got what was going on. This is a sample copy of the share certificate from a few years ago, and you know how we do this. 
the share certificates for our Patreon people are uh, mixed media, is that the expression? The shares themselves are printed with laser, inkjet, not laser, they're printed with inkjet on washi paper. But each one has a woodblock print embedded into it. So we print first the woodblock print on a blank piece of paper. Then once it's dry, we put them through our Epson and get the uh, inkjet part. And it's too bad. We actually spoil a lot of prints by doing this because getting the settings ready on the Epson and it runs out of ink and it smears and it does stuff, we spoil the prints. But we can't do it the other way around because the, to do the print part, the paper has to be moist. And if we've done the inkjet printing first and moisten it, you know what happens. It doesn't work. So we print the woodblock prints first, and then when they're all done, in they go through the Epson. They get trimmed. Dave sits here, signs, and seals them all. We number them all, and out. <coughs> out they go to the Patreon share people. So my job now is I've got to prepare the Patreon share certificate for 2022. Yes. Is he watching today? Is Mr. Good Supporter, Miss, there's no Mr. Miss here, is Good Supporter watching our stream today? Perhaps so, in case I'm sorry for doxing you. <laughs> it doesn't matter, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> so this year, as you've seen, what we're gonna do is something like, we're going to do something like this. We're going to put a piece from the Hiroshi Yoshida print into our share certificate this year. <clears throat> and it's kind of breaking a rule I've had. What I've done so far is to keep the printing of these manageable, we've kept them a maximum of four impressions. This one is going to take more than four impressions, but whatever, so be it. These people are supporting us very, very, very heavily, very well, and it's incumbent on me to make sure we treat them properly. Okay, I need a ruler. This will do it. Okay, I printed this yesterday over at the, the copy shop, but this is in no condition to paste down because this is actually not the exact same size of the share certificates. So this is, this one is the real size. So I'm going to use this as my master for pasting this down. So there we go, you get the idea now. This is an actual share certificate. So this was one that was printed on the blocks a couple of years ago. So this tells me the registration where this oval is supposed to go. 27, no, 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 it's not gonna be 27. John is pulling your leg here, relax. I think we're going to do it with maybe six. I don't know. <coughs> the real print itself, the real print itself has, I think it's about 14. I'm not sure. I don't remember. It's on the website, actually. It shows step by step on the website. It's about 14. For this version, we're going to do obviously a sky, a sea, maybe two colors for the sea, one for the boat in shadow, gradation on the sea, gradation on the sail. So maybe one, two, three, four, five, six. I think six will do it. We'll see. I think six will do it.
So this now will, will, if I glue this down on our block the normal way, we're going to do it upside down so that I can put one here, one here, and one more on each of the two back sides and then get another piece of wood. What should you have clipped? A long walk down from the Yoshiwara. Did a lady go by in kimono and hairdo and stuff? She's not Yoshiwara material. She will be doing, uh, there's concerts at the Kokkaido all this week. There was a big deal yesterday. There was a uh, no, traditional Japanese dance, I think, was going on yesterday at the Kokkaido, the municipal hall just down the street next to us. There used to be the city hall there, but now it's the municipal hall. And they rent it out at very reasonable rates. So lots and lots of things like a, uh, uh, people who have clubs that do Japanese dance and stuff like that, they rent out the hall for their uh, for their yearly concerts and things like that. Oh, you know, the other way around. High platform heels, short shorts, no idea. In that case, I keep quiet. I don't know. <laughs> I thought you were referring to old style Yoshiwara. I don't know. <laughs> No comment on that one. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay. But it was this there was yesterday then because of that a bit of a social cultural disparity here. Yesterday the place was busy jumping. Asakusa was busy, hoppy dory, hoppy dory. And it was kids, couples, drinking, drinking, drinking. And then in the middle of this, you get the young girls who are here for the kimono rental. They sit there, uh, they, they prance around all the time. They've, they've rented their kimono. So that is, and then the third group we saw yesterday was because of the dance, traditional dance concert, we had all these ladies walking around with you know, big hairdos and kimonos and all dressed up and carrying shamisen cases and stuff like that. So it was really maybe, now that I think about it, the typical Asakusa day yesterday. Wine, women, and song. <laughs> yes, now that I think about it. So. <laughs> and of course, the horse races were on. There was some kind of derby on yesterday. I forget what it was. So the place, the off-track betting center, was jumping. They were lined up. My god, they were lined up almost all the way down to our place here. So yeah, a very typical Asakusa Sunday yesterday. Mukohankan sitting here deserted and closed in the middle of it. The one thing that's missing from the equation is the foreign tourists, of course. Yeah. Now, there's a little bit of a, an, anom an anomaly here, a discrepancy here, that some of you might notice what's going on. <coughs> Normally, when we, how can I explain this without getting too convoluted? The wood blocks, when they're carved, and the finished prints are always different sizes. If you imagine a carved wood block to print something, we put ink on it, we put moist paper on, and we print it. The moist paper then dries and shrinks, and the finished print is smaller than the blocks. Now what I'm doing right now is I'm taking a finished print from the share certificates from two years ago, and I've positioned my key lines on it for this year, and I'm getting ready here to sit here and put it into the registration marks. But this piece of paper is dry. It's smaller than what it was at the time that we printed it two years ago. So if I did this, if you make a carved block set, print from it, and then use the finished print for your reproduction, print from it, then use your finished print for a reproduction, your print is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller as the ver versions go by. So what I have to do now, ideally what I should do with this is I should moisten this paper now to the same level as it was when it was printed. It will expand. If I then paste it down, it will then put this key line in exactly microscopically the right place where it should be. But it's dry. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cheat a little bit. When it comes time to glue this in a minute from now, I am not going to put it exactly in these registration marks. I'm going to slip it out 
just so much. On over here, I'm going to slip it out just so much. You can't see what I'm doing, but I'm moving the paper up, up, and out, maybe a third of a millimeter or something. And that will compensate, if I get it right, that will compensate for the amount of shrinkage here, and it will put that key line in the proper place. Got that, class? Okay, now I haven't paid much attention to where the camera is. Okay, I got you, I got you, I got you. Let's do this. Okay, corner mark is here. Mark is there. This is going in upside down. I'll first, after I put the glue on, I'll put it in like this. I will gently slide it out just a smidge and then I will paste it down, rub it, bingo. Something else to mention about the peel or not peel. I didn't bring it down. A few months ago, up on Yahoo Auction, an auction came up for some washi. I have different alerts in the Yahoo Auction system and one of the alerts is washi combined with the word for old, furui, shuko, iru iru. We've got lots of alerts. And a couple of months ago, more, more than a couple of months ago, three, four, five months ago, an auction came up for some old washi paper. The guy didn't know what it was. He had two boxes of this stuff. He didn't know. All he knew was washi. So I looked at this. I looked at the pictures and I looked at the blurred copy of the wrapping paper and I realized that it said gampi. So what the guy had was he had an auction for some old gampi paper. When you look at the other pictures, you could see some of it was, I don't know, what's the word, not fo foxing, it was moldy. Some of this stuff was moldy. We couldn't possibly use this paper for making woodblock prints. But when we're using gampi for doing transfer, if this paper's a little bit moldy, that's not going to bother me one little bit. We, tr we copy it, we transfer, we paste it on, we glue it, we wash it off, it's done. It doesn't matter at all. We are not making prints of this stuff. Anyway, long story short, I bid. A few other people bid. A bunch of other people bid. This was a hot item. Some old pre-war packages of Gumpy paper. Long story short, I'm telling you this story. You know the answer. I got the stuff. And it's been sitting upstairs in a box all that time. We haven't had much chance to, to mess around with it. Yesterday, when I was getting ready to prepare this, I was out. My normal gampi paper here that I use is out. You saw the other day, I tried to peel it off and I wasn't any five mome gampi, so, so I used the three. But I thought, this is an interesting tip. The Ty Dave, get up there and get this. So I cracked open the box yesterday, looked at some of this. It really, really looks like a treasure. It looks fabulous. It's gampi paper. It's really super thin. So there's good news, bad news here. It's really super thin. It's going to be easy to see from the back side. It's going to be carvable. It'll work wonders. But don't get excited about peeling because this isn't a multi-bodied, multi-layered gumpy paper where we can tease off a bit and then peel off a strip at the back. So this is our first test of pre-war gumpy paper, way older than I am. And this paper's been sitting in a box in some warehouse for my entire life. And yesterday, I pulled up one sheet of it, copied it over, and now we're going to use this. So how do you feel? You're the sheet of Gumpy. This dude opens the package yesterday. The Gumpy paper sees the light of air for the first time in like two generations. Since 19, whatever, I don't know how old it is. It's, it's easily pre-war. So this is easily 80, 90, perhaps 100 years old. The top piece of paper sits there and gets the sunlight and, and air for the first time, then this dude grabs it, starts to chop it up, paste it down, and I'm not going to kill it. <laughs> but it's going to get used. It's going to get used. If we don't use it, there's no meaning to these things. You can see the stack of Gumpy paper. They've all been talking to each other for the past 90 years, and the top sheet, the top sheets get lifted up. Hi, guys. See you later. Hi, bye bye. Have a good travel. You know, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Check. 
Check. Got it? No mistake? So the box opens after 90 years, and the paper sees this bearded foreign dude peering down at them saying, hmm, what have we got here? But then on the other hand, when you think of all the places that box could have gone, this is the best place on the planet. That paper is going to get used properly and with meaning and with appreciation. There's that point of view, you know. So I'm being sarcastic about this, but actually that paper, assuming it turns out to be usable. Okay, let me be quiet here. Here we go. Okay, we're going for Baron. Who needs a Baron? Okay, the carry sheet is now gone. The, the only reason we needed this was to locate this thing in the right place. Somebody says, what were the other bidders going to do with it? I don't know, you tell me, Gumpy paper is, uh, is treasured stuff, you know. I don't know, my friend Peter in Kamakura, he makes prints on Gumpy paper. He's, he's doing photogravures, and the finished print of his is on thin Gumpy paper. Then there are people who draw on it. We've seen this. Remember, I showed you a scroll, a roll the other day, a couple of the other day, many months ago. Remember, we opened the roll bit by bit by bit by bit by bit. They were drawings of Hoxai images. That was done on exactly this kind of paper. Sheets about this big, and somebody drew on it. Okay, now, this isn't going to peel. Please, don't get excited. Let, let's see what happens, but don't sit here waiting for some magnificent, glorious peel. Oops, no, be careful, Dave, be careful. It's pulling up, but no, it's not going to peel. We're just going to simply peel the back the traditional way. Look at this. You can see what's happening. Some fibers are coming, but not enough to hang together to make an actual separate sheet. This is totally the normal way that people put use gumpy paper for printing and stuff. You paste it down and roll off the little bits you don't need. This is what we're doing here right now. This is much more useful for showing people how Japanese prints are made than that peel thing we do. Because that peeling game we play isn't the traditional way of doing it at all. What you're seeing here is exactly how it works in real life, in normal life. There we go, there we go, there we go, there we go. What I should have shown you though too, I didn't think about it, is the paper itself This is the stuff. This is about, the sheet was about the A big, and I cut two pieces off it. So it's not uh, A4 size. Yeah, if you take A4 and a little bit bigger, that's the size of these gumpy sheets. And all I know is pre-war. It looks absolutely beautiful. There are very few I know, clumps of stuff inside. There is a tsunome, uh, uh, lines that you can see from the bamboo screen where it was, uh, where it was uh, dipped and rocked. It looks absolutely beautiful. I think calligraphers or somebody who was painting or people like me, woodbuck printmakers, this is an absolute treasure. Absolute treasure. And we got, there's two packs in there and there's a thousand sheets in each pack. 
So I am now sitting on 2,000, well, no, minus one, 1,999 sheets of this gumpy. Looks like we're going to get a good report. This is usable stuff. We had to pay for it. It wasn't free, but considering that there's 2,000 sheets, the cost per sheet wasn't all that bad. Okay, let's get to work. Do I hunt for pre-war paper? Well, hunting, if you mean by hunting, do I have uh, auction alerts ready? Yes, of course. I can't really use that kind of paper for making prints. It's almost always in terrible condition. It's, it's moldy, it's just been rolled up and put on a shelf. So very little of the paper that we've ever found has actually been useful for making prints. But this one doesn't matter if it's moldy. Have I ever found Gampi via Yahoo? It was unusual. This is the first Gampi I've scored on Yahoo, period. It's really, really, really rare. This is the first Gampi we've ever found on yeah. auction. I can't do this yet. Just a minute. Just a minute. Before we carve, one more job to do. Does anyone still make it today? Yes, Gampi is made. The place we're buying, we buy it from a place in Shigaken called Naruko Washi, and we sell it on our website. We've got nice Gampi, the stuff you see me using normally. Gumpy is available. It costs, but it's available. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, thank you. Camera needs refocusing. I'm trying to keep on this. Trying to keep on. Trying to keep up with it. The knife is not to broken here, not at all. It doesn't need the 400 stone to re reshape it. The knife just needs touching up. Bingo, we're done. Okay, I'm not sure if you saw what went on there. A couple of things. I'm using this cheap little 1,000 grit diamond stone, and we, we, we were testing these a while ago, and I've switched pretty much to using this exclusively. It works so well. I've got my hand on the mat here, and what I was doing was with my hand sliding back and forth on the mat, my finger holding the knife, it means I get absolutely perfect accuracy. The traditional way of doing it on the stone, rubbing your whole body, it's great, it's wonderful if you can do it. I don't have that kind of skill, but for me like this, this thing gets absolutely perfectly flat. The other thing you saw me do was, and it's really cool to try and do it this way, is do it one pass. If you put it down, rub something, look at it, put it down, rub, look at it, put it down, rub, look at it, almost certainly you're gonna get a bit of a different angle each time. It might be a bit this way, a bit that way, a bit this way. And you end up with a really funny shape on this. By doing it all in one, 
you know, and keeping your hands still, you know that you're going to get a beautiful flat surface. So the goal is to do it all in one. Then first also, I don't know if it was apparent or not, I started quite firmly grinding. I'm pushing with the back of my finger. I'm trying to cut, cut metal for the first X dozen strokes. And I moved around, moved around, moved around on the stone, and then bit by bit by bit, it might have been apparent by the sound, I backed off on the pressure. And maybe even I started moving slower. Softer, 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 softer. And by the end of it, I was just barely sliding across the stone. And the idea is, when you bear down to cut metal, you're actually really gouging, ripping, ripping grooves into that blade based on the grid size here. But bit by bit by bit towards the end of it, if you back off the pressure, it sort of polishes a lot of those grooves out and you get a smoother surface on your blade ready for the next stage. And the next stage is going to be back on my traditional stone. Just to put the final edge on it. And honestly, you know, we could, oh my God, am I, am I actually saying this in public? You can actually, you don't need this. This blade now, sharpened on that 1,000 grit, that would do this job. I could do this. I could start carving now and it wouldn't bother. I wouldn't do that if I was doing the most fine, delicate UQA hair, but for work like this now, it would be absolutely okay. But let's do the right thing. Let's put the final polish on it. course, take off the burr on the back. And you can see our hollow ground shape on the back. If I get the light, so you can see the hollow ground shape. So all the pressure on the back side went right to the tip. And now the very final stroke, we've got it flat. I lift it up and make one, two strokes. That puts an extra bevel on the back side. There you can see, there, look at the light. See the light shining? There's a white line along the back side. That's an extra bevel. So we've got a flat surface, a tiny bevel on the back, the main bevel on the front. And if we didn't do that bevel on the back, the edge would be too sharp and it would crumble as soon as I put it in the wood. Very nice sharpening, considering I'm out of touch, haven't done this for weeks, months. Let's get to work. Now, let's find our position. Okay. It was water. There was no oil there. I put water on the stone. Just water. What's the question about the full size block? I know. We're using a piece of wood here that's almost the same size as the print, but we're only using one part of it. So I'm going to later, after I finish carving this, I'm going to turn the block around and use it heads and tails. Then I'm going to flip it over and we're going to do two more colors. So we're going to do four colors on this same piece of wood. And there will be four sets of registration marks on this block. So rather than one, two, three, four pieces of wood, we're going to use the same piece of wood for four colors because it's such a small area. If you have a full-size color area, full sky or a sea, of course, you can't do that. 
These are the new share certificates for 2022. Yes. Are they late? I don't know. I think May or June is about usually when these happen. It's been a long time since I've carved one of these prints. And I have to remember here, this is a Shin Hunga print. This is not Ukiyo-e. And the lines of this thing, the lines are not clean, sharp, beautifully calligraphy type lines. You can see, the look up here, for example, look, look, look. They don't match, they don't hit, they're broken, they're rough. This is not delicate ukiyo -e. and This is against Dave's character, so I've got to try and be careful here. Dave tends to always overdo and overthink and make things always so super clean. And this print does not need or want that. And it really, really isn't, isn't my character, absolutely. So get them looking natural, but not looking, I don't know, badly carved. And also we are shrinking this down hugely. So how much detail to put in and how much detail to leave out, of course, is another factor. This isn't a, a, a total miniature reproduction with every dot and every line. For example, on the, the main version, the sails themselves, they have these little, you see the tick marks? Tick, 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 tick. I guess it's something related to the way the sail folds up and things like this. They made sense. It makes sense to have them there in this version, but when we go this small right now, I really don't think it makes sense to put them there. There's our vacuum cleaner lady back at work. They were busy over the weekend at that hotel. Lots and lots of people seeing, I don't know, they come in, I, I said Asakusa was busy yesterday, and it was busy mostly with Japanese people, so we've got lots and lots of domestic tourism. People seem to come to Tokyo for the weekend. The airlines are all offering bargains and stuff like this. So that hotel was busy Friday night, Saturday night, and, and maybe, I don't know, last night, I don't know. But it's now quiet again. It's not a business type hotel.
Well, it's a long weekend in America, is it this weekend? So, so, so it's a holiday evening today, is it? Tomorrow is a holiday, Monday? The tracing that I'm carving here actually it's a bit unusual. We have already a version of this print that I've made many years ago, back in the 2000 it must be. I made it in 1999 or 2000. And when I made this version, I followed Yoshida's own instructions. He published a book back in 1939, I think it was called Japanese Woodblock Printing or Japanese Woodblock Printmaking. It's on uh, my old woodblock.com website to, to read. All the text of the text and images of his original book are there to, to read for free on the woodblock.com website. And one thing that he included in his book, he talked and talked and talked about many things about production, artistic aspects, and, and production aspects. And as part of explaining how he and his workshop were making the Shinhaga prints, he included this this image, this picture in his book, along with a complete breakdown of all the color separations. And you can see it. If you go to woodblock.com, look for the encyclopedia. No, look for the library section. And then look for the Yoshida book inside the library. And then page by page by page, you will see. And there's an illustration of his original tracing. And he said, go for it. Here's the, here's the tracing I used to make the print. And last night, when I was preparing this hunched up for here, I used his drawing. So what you're seeing in, in a bit blurry format here on the block in front of me, this is Yoshida's own sengaki, Yoshida's own drawing for making the key block of this print, which he published openly in 1939 and said, go for it. Instructions on how to make the print. I followed that, those instructions in the year, as I said, about 2000, and we've published our print based on them. So anybody, it's open game, open season, anybody can do this, this same print. This color breakdown, showing where the, what colors were mixed, showing how the gradations were applied. 
all that information is in his book. Has somebody got a link? I should have peppered a link for it. Yeah, it's in the encyclopedia section too. Yeah, it's there as well. It's in the library. Yeah. Yeah, number seven. That's right. There are two things. Ha, ha, sengaki. Sen is line. Gaki is draw. The line drawing. So the sengaki is the artist sitting on a piece of paper. There's the line drawing. It could be for a painting. It could be for book reproduction. It could be for making prints, whatever. Sengaki is the drawings that the artist's drawing. Hanshita literally means wood wood below, it's upside down. Hanshita is the piece of paper that we then paste onto the wood for carving. Sometimes they are the same thing. The artist's sengaki could be on thin paper, which then gets over there, draw the lines on it, put the calligraphy in, bang, paste it down, you're away to go. Or the hanshita could be prepared using the artist's sengaki as a master reference copy. Somebody could trace it, do this and that. So they're the same, but they're not the same. And in Yoshida's book, he repeatedly refers to Sengaki, Sengaki all the time because that's his, uh, that's his point of view. He is the designer. He also talks about something interesting there. I don't, I don't remember where it is in the book. He also says that his, his custom, his habit, was that he would do sketches, think about it for a while, do a drawing, think about it for a while, do a drawing, think about it for a while, and say, okay, that's the print we want to make. But even then, he says, he wouldn't move right ahead with the production. He would take the Sengaki, and he said he stuck it up on the wall somewhere. And every now and then he would look back at it again, and come back and look back at it again. And he said he had to let it sit for a while to make sure this was going to be okay. Defects and stuff would become apparent after seeing it for a while, sitting on the wall in front of him. Whether he actually did this all the time or not, I don't know, but he describes in his book doing this. Even when you think it's ready to go, hold back, let it sit for a while, and come and look at it again later. I think it's sort of a, an ideal viewpoint where how much of that can happen in practice, I don't know, because, you know, cut, print, you gotta get going, you gotta make these things. There's four of those things. Should we put some of those lines on? They're right here. Suppose we just did that. One, two. Where's the fourth Here's sirens, and we're coming into siren season. Oh no. 
it's hot. It's going to be really hot. And uh, there's a the thing, you know, every year this happens here in Tokyo, well, all over Japan. X numbers of elderly people, they either don't have an air conditioner or they're not using an air conditioner or whatever. And it's, it's a thing here. I think probably not just in Japan, I think in other countries as well. Every summer you see quite a number of uh, elderly people who don't make it through because of uh, heat stroke or whatever. <coughs> and we'll be getting the notices from City Hall. In fact, it's probably already started. I haven't seen any of the uh, mail and stuff for a long time now. But coming up to this season now, May, June, July, August, the notices from City Hall will have this this heavily uh, emphasized. Attention all the elderly people, you know, if you don't have a cooler, if you don't have an air conditioner in your home, here's the places, call this number, the little old folks car will come and take you to the library and stuff like this. The City Hall's here really, really, really try and keep on top of this. They're aware that uh, sometimes that other people don't have access to an air conditioner or they don't know how to make it work or, or it's broken or whatever. There's all levels of it. And every city hall in the country is trying to keep on top of this and reduce that number to zero every year. There's a community centers, libraries, you name it, they're set up as uh, receiving places for the old folks to spend the day in. If you've never been to Japan in the middle of summer, beware. It's, well, it depends where you are in Japan. Japan's a big place, of course. Up in Hokkaido, it's maybe. Oh, Ayano-san, hello, hello. It's that time, is it? Nine o'clock. Soka, soka. You don't need to wear a mask. You're going to stay away? Okay. She's going to keep away from me, so it's okay. <laughs> Excuse me a minute. Ano, you can see the inbox, right? He, 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 he. Did you see the couple of notes I sent you about a few things to be careful of? Yeah, I yeah. Them Okay, all right. Them. all right, thank you. This lady is going to be busy today. We put that mailing out last Thursday or so. She caught up with everything Friday before she left here. But over the weekend, Friday night's orders, all the Saturday, all the Sunday, everything that's coming over the weekend, it's all in the inbox now. And she is going to have a long, 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 long day chewing through it, replying to people, processing the orders, sending them all through. The thing too, I know Sunday, I know even when it's a full inbox, please don't you know, go into automatic mode, you know. 
one by one, take the time and answer carefully. You know, if it doesn't get finished, it's okay. Just uh, please try and keep avoid the mistakes. Huh? Thank you. I speak from personal experience. You know? How was your weekend? Uh, good, good, good. What did I do? Well, if you can't remember, I mean, it probably means it was a good weekend. <laughs> right? Yeah, I think <laughs> so. so. What did I do, actually? Uh, I saw my friend. We went to this uh, Mexican place uh, near my house. Uh -huh. One of my favorite restaurants in Tokyo. Um, I went with yesterday. yesterday. Running, jogging. Jogging, yes. Yeah. Okay, okay. 6.5 kilometers. Hey, hey, hey. That's my record, yes. Really, so jogging? Yeah. They're practicing for a marathon? Uh, 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 probably. So okay, so okay. Uh, for me, it was walking yesterday in the early morning before it got too hot. Uh, uh, I left about 6 o'clock, got back about 10. I went to Eitaibashi. Oh, nice. But half mistake. I walked halfway, all the way down on the shadow side of the river. Uh -huh. And I tried to come back on the west side of the river. But even then, 8 o'clock in the morning, the sun was so hot. So I had to switch over to the shady side again. So, it was so. hot yesterday, almost summer. Yeah, the machine told me 16,000 steps. So I think, I, I can't swim on the weekends. I saw that. Because the pool, I can't get the pool. Oh, no, my, my ticket. I, I, uh, I only have a weekday ticket. Uh, so, 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 so. Eitai Bashi. John. John, John, John. John here. John is, a, John is an Eitai Bashi fan. I walked across both bridges yesterday. I walked down the river to Eitai Bashi, crossed over, and then walked up a little bit and crossed over again on Kiyosumi Bashi. Kiyosubashi, Kiyosumibashi. And I can report, John's a fan of these bridges. They are in beautiful, beautiful, beautiful condition. I had heard about this when in the run-up to the Olympics over the past couple of years, somebody made the decision that the Sumida River area should be prettified and, you know, cleaned up and all that stuff. And they repainted and rebuilt, actually, all the bridges between Asakusa and the bottom, Eitaibashi, and they put new lighting systems on all of them. And they are beautiful, 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 beautiful. The paint is gorgeous. The bridges look in perfect condition. They're set for another, another generation. An evening photo with Eitai Bashi. Yeah, well, they're all lit up now, all the way up, you know. They would be a real good little album to take, so. Yeah, I should have told. <laughs> I didn't take it with me. I'm sorry. It's back upstairs. It's in the back of the closet now. I wouldn't do that to John. It wouldn't be fair. <laughs> <laughs> a sky photograph of his favorite place in Tokyo. Yeah, I, I should take a sky photograph of the sky tree. I think that's going to be a meme on this stream for a long, long, long time. A sky photograph. People are already, what is he talking about? It's probably already started. I asked her, what did you do on the weekend? And she says, I can't remember. <laughs> I think, depending on your age, that's either a very good sign or <laughs> a very bad sign. <laughs> oh my God, people would ask me, what did you do on the weekend? And I can't remember. And <laughs> Oh, 
south of those two bridges, the Eitaibashi and the Kios, Kiosumibashi, I cannot remember the name of that one, Kiosumibashi, Kiosumibashi, they're beautiful, absolutely beautiful. They're both, uh, I believe they're both post-earthquake, I think, they were built after the earthquake, perhaps destroyed previous bridges. I don't remember the exact dates of construction. They are the first, I think they are the first generation of new bridges post-earthquake. And I think also they're sort of done on European models. One of those, I don't remember which one, looks like a Battersea Bridge in London. It was an era where Japan was still doing most of its architectural stuff with imported architects and designers from Europe. Next one to the north of Eitaibashi is uh, it's O O Shin O Hashi is the next one north, and then the one after that is Kiyosubashi. Then after that it's uh, it's uh, Shin O Hashi. No, just there's two bridges that are called O Hashi. One is Shin O Hashi, and one is I don't remember. I don't remember. Oh, Jacques is here, Sumitagawa Bridges. There you are, there you are. What are they going south? It's Azumabashi here, then it's ano, Komagatabashi, then it's Umayabashi, then next one is uh, Kuramaebashi, and then Yogokubashi, and then Ohashi, kana? Shin Ohashi, something Ohashi. And then below that it's Kiyosubashi, and then another one called Ohashi, something Ohashi, and then Eitaibashi. I got it. I think I got it. Chuo Ohashi is the next one to the south of Eitaibashi. No, 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 no. Chuo Ohashi. Okay. The Shin Ohashi then is the one between Eitaibashi and Kiyosubashi. I <laughs> guess I don't know. <laughs> This is the pickup for the Korean hot dog place. Should we turn off our audio a little bit? Oops. Let's turn down the outside audio. He's parked right outside our camera. Remind me to put it back up later. He couldn't park where he should do because that little truck was in the way. Oh, 
oh, I see, he's moved down the road to his place. So that little truck got out of the way. He was just waiting for the little truck to move. Got it. Hui, 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 hui. Is there going to be a gradation on the certificate? I don't know. I know I really don't know. There's lots of ways to do this. As I said, I'm thinking there's going to be about six blocks. I have to balance the time spent on, you know, what? The real print has many gradations. There's a gradation on the sky, gradation on the sails. There's two gradations on the sea from the sides. There's a gradation on the sea reflection. I really don't know. I'm just going to hold at the moment on all those decisions. First step, cut the key block, then do a separation. And I think, as I said, I think it'll be key plus five on whatever we can do for an attractive looking print with those five. It's not something I can really spend a whole you know, if we make a miniature version of this print, that uses up all the revenue from the, the people. So it's, you know, 
we have to give a present, nice present to people, but we can't use up all their money making that present, otherwise there's no meaning for the Patreon project to start with. You know? Patreon isn't selling prints, Patreon is uh, people supporting our work, so uh, whatever, I'll find a balance, no idea. We'll worry about it when we get there. We'll make some decisions when I get there, and probably I'll go overboard as usual, but we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens when we get there. And now she's going to be work, working through her inbox today, which is all the orders that have come in over the past few days, Friday night, Saturday, and Sunday. And uh, lots of people, of course, are still ordering the new print, the Descending Geese print from the Eight Views of Cats. And uh, as I told in that email we sent last week, and has since been confirmed, the original printing batch, we did, I think she did 50, 58 copies. <coughs> the original printing batch are now, of course, uh, all spoken for. So I changed the website during the weekend to reflect that and to tell people that uh, if they order the print now, they're not going to get it shipped, you know, today, tomorrow. It won't be shipped for 10 days to two weeks from now. And our printer, Chiharu-san, has started working on the next batch of them. It's going to be a hugely successful print. I'm so happy with it. Now that the Descending Geese print is up and running and done, Focus on the Eight Cats series now moves to the Evening Bell print, which is has been in test printing for over a year. I don't mean that it's been a year every day somebody is, is thrashing at it. No, just it's been up there in the room for over a year. We spent time on it, we put it aside, spent time on it, put it aside. And it's now time to pull that one to the front burner and get busy with that one. And then I also now have to really get busy and I have to s initiate the next couple of cat prints. I have to make some decisions and it might be autumn moon, it might be uh, clearing weather, I don't know, I don't know. But I've got to get the next couple of the ones chosen and uh, up and running. It's on my to-do list. There are actually, you know, speaking of what this is, this is a share, the design for the Patreon share certificate for 2022. There are still on my desk upstairs some share certificates, the previous one, that are waiting for me to sign and send out. So it could be actually there's people sitting here who are on the Patreon campaign and who are due a share certificate. And this is not the one they're going to be getting. They're going to be getting, you know, if it's up, if it's from before May or something, they're, they're going to be getting the last one, the previous one. 
So uh, I'm trying to get this done in time so that when it is time to make the switch over, we get I get the switch over. But uh, there are still some copies of the previous Patreon share certificate on my desk waiting to be signed and processed. <laughs> Which one is this? Is this one? Ayana-san, something else I noticed in the inbox. I know uh, I can't mention the name here because I'm live, but there's an order from a person whose initials are D N, and then later on in the inbox is an order from a person with the same name D N. It's not the same person. It's not the same person. Have a look. I know I, you before you start answering. Have a look yourself. I think it's a coincidence. The same named person. Exactly the same. First name. And it's name. it's not the next order, it's the one after. So have a look and tell me what you think. It looks like a completely different person. Just be careful. Okay. Oh. It looks like an extraordinary coincidence. Wow. Oh, show and tell. Oh my God, is it 920? No, it can't be. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, okay. I had no idea. I was thinking it was about not 8.30. I knew it wasn't 8.30. Oh, yeah, we did the hunch step preparation. Okay, 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 okay. Sorry about that. I had no idea what time it was. Sorry, no idea.
Do you see it? Yep. It's different people, right? Different people. That's yeah. incredible. That's incredible. Incredible, yeah. <laughs> okay, show and tell, show and tell. Sorry about that. I did put the sound back on the street camera. As soon as he drove away, I put it back up to where it was. The camera's got a mind of its own. Okay, we'll go, we'll go back to our black book here. Where are we up to? I don't really know. We've been flipping through this thing. Oh, speak of that, Gary, Gary Ludke, he wrote an email to me yesterday, the designer of this print. I haven't talked to him in years. He's retired up in Door County, Wisconsin, and he's still actually active. Where did we get to? Where did we get to? We saw Horatio stuff. We saw Jim Mundy stuff. We haven't seen these, right? Okay, looks like it's going to be a bit of a, a miscellaneous batch here. This, this. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I also forgot these. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. Let's send all. Let's put a bookmarker in here. We'll come back here. Hi, right, quick, 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 quick. Let's zoom in. Those of you who were here last time. You saw these, we are now gonna have a look at them. Just a quick zoom close up. They came out of the frame in seconds. In fact, after we finished the, the stream the other day, I closed the stream, looked at the frame, opened the back, and not 60 seconds later, the prints were out of the frame. The guy had put them in there with some little bit of reverse tape, he'd stuck them on the top, and they came out of there in seconds. Just seconds. So let's take a quick boo through these, just so you can see what you couldn't see yesterday. And it's almost certain it's kabuki. This is Kanjin Cho, which is one of the most famous kabuki plays ever done. They're all clearly, these are kabuki episodes based on different aspects from Japanese culture. Let's just skip through. Can we see the embossing? They're beautifully, beautifully embossed. Nice quality paper, beautifully printed. Perfect sizing. I wish we could do this. I wish we had paper like this and sizing like this and wood like this. I'm like, oh, keep quiet, keep quiet, keep quiet. Tell you what, let me slip, let me skip through twice. We'll go through once. You can see the full. Here we go. We have a, obviously a matsuri, a drum and a, a like a li not a lion dance, but a dance of some kind. I cannot read this one, I'm sorry. Clearly another kabuki dance episode. We have perhaps a famous kumadori. And I, it looks like five something. I don't know, I can't read it. This is Urashima, it's readable, Urashima. Urashima Taro story, a treasure box, is fishing and the sea. And the design is fun. Just people having such fun with design. This is perhaps, this is Ushiwakamaru. This is the Yosh Yoshi Tsune Benke story, perhaps. Don't quote me. No idea. These are such so beautifully made and so beautifully printed. You look at this, why do the gradation twice? Why not just print the purple background, you know? Why go to the extra trouble? Because it's beautiful and because the people who commissioned it, they knew, they knew what you were capable of and they wanted to see beautiful work. Bit of a blob here. This is a fox, I guess, is it? It's a fox, something again, a dance, a shrine dance, you tell me. Okay, let's zoom in, go right through the back and then put them away.
the extra touch, the yellow on the chest there, that's not a misregistration. That's a separate, it's carved on the same block as the helmet. So nicely done. These will all be clearly well-known themes, just, I'm sorry, I can't pick up the references to them all myself, and it really is difficult to read, I'm sorry. But they are all clearly well-known themes, which somebody with a real good knowledge of traditional Japanese culture would, would notice in an instant. The cobweb there was done with metallic pigment. It was done with pigment on top, opaque pigment, not reverse white. These flakes of foam are in reverse white, but that cobweb was on top. Look at how vivid and alive this is, you know. The carver would have carved this just in minutes. Bang, bang, chop, 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 chop. So we have a mix. We have references to Japanese traditional dance, to kabuki, to folk tales, to uh, no plays. We have references to many, many, many parts of Japanese culture here. <laughs> Good fun and beautifully carved and beautifully printed. This was the last gasp. We talk about this all the time. This is the 1960s, I think. Late 50s, 60s, or early 70s. The last gasp, when the pre-war craftsmen were still alive, happy to be back at work, and killing it. The last gasp. Okay, there we go. They cost me, what did they cost? I pulled the auction up yesterday, 3,100 yen. The frame, I, what I did is I took these out of the frame, and within minutes, I took the frame, put it outside with a little sticker saying, help yourself. It's actually still there. Usually those frames, when we do that, they disappear within a few minutes. This one hasn't disappeared because it's kind of big and it's difficult to carry home. But yeah, it's outside there, and somebody, hopefully today, somebody will walk off with it. Maybe what I need to do is I need to put some cardboard or something out there so people can, can wrap it up and take it home. No, last gasp, you know, I'm talking about the, the level of the craftsmen, the pre-war craftsmen, you know. It's, it's been a never-ending story for a hundred years or so, of course, you know. The level of craftsmanship has been going down, 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 down. Maybe now it's going to stop its decline. Maybe now it's going to come back up. I don't know. We're going to do what we can. Okay, it's already 9.30. Let's just look at these last two little prints that are in here. Then we'll close this off. We'll get to the next page tomorrow, next, next time. Let's just look at these. And these are random prints. First one we have, this is from my friend in Kyoto, Richard Steiner. He's been here way longer than I have. I'm not the oldest foreigner here doing woodblock printing like this. Richard Steiner's been here since before me. He came, I believe, as a missionary, and this would be, oh, 1970s, late 70s or early 80s, maybe late 70s. And he set up in Kyoto, and he worked with a workshop there, he worked with the teacher there, and he does individual prints, of course. He's not, a, he's not a reproduction worker like me at all. He's an individual artist. He will chop stuff and carve it, and he doesn't really care about details of, of craftsmanship. His image, he's, a, he's a, a different kind of approach. He's more in the sosaku world. He just wants to put an image on paper, and he doesn't care that it's blobbed or blurred or whatever. He wants the living stuff on paper. Someone like Richard looks at me and thinks I'm too much of a control freak and that all the life is sucked out of my prints, and there's no vivid living mood left in them. 
And I guess he's right. They're a different approach. I look at Richard's stuff and I say, it may be living, but couldn't you make it just a bit more carefully? <laughs> it's completely, completely two worlds, whatever. So he's a real nice guy. I'm 70 this year. Richard must be 80 this year, 80 or 81. If you Google it, Google it, Richard Steiner, Kyoto, lots of stuff comes up. He might be struggling now, I don't know. He's been teaching it for many, many years. He's made a living mostly as a teacher and as a guru doing it. Super nice guy. And uh, the prints he makes, I don't really understand them. But uh, what, what can we say? You know? <laughs> it, needs, uh, it needs all different types in this world. And speaking about 1970s, this one, this is different. This is Linita Shimizu. Uh, an American lady. She has a last name Shimizu because a million years, uh, uh, you know, when she was younger, she married uh, a gentleman in America uh, whose name was Shimizu. But she is American, American, American. She came here in, I believe, the late 70s, also went to Kyoto, found a teacher, learned about the techniques, and then went back to America and has been practicing the craft in America for as long as I've been doing it here in Japan. She is a super nice lady. Somebody give us a website, please. If you type Linita Shimizu, it's whatever. Her website is Linita Shimizu Woodprints or something like this. You can find them. She's living in, I believe, Connecticut and has a really nice touch. And she would be, let's do that. Can I say that? The in-between. I sort of half joking you criticize Richard because although his prints are original, I feel frustrated because they're not made so nicely. Richard is frustrated by my work because it's made nicely, but it doesn't have an original feeling. Linita is actually in the middle there. All of her work is original. She doesn't do reproductions. She makes work with meaning and stuff, and yet she makes it nicely and carefully. So maybe someone like Linita is actually the best balance here between beautiful craftsmanship and making prints with meaning. There's going to be more of her stuff in this folder as we get to it. And if we don't get to it, we'll go pull some off the shop because we have a bunch of her prints in the shop and on the catalog here. She is ace. She is ace. She's about my age, I guess. I'm not quite sure how much longer she's going to be doing this. Maybe she's going to retire soon. I don't know. Or maybe she's going to keep going. But for the moment, let's let this little print stand as a marker for her work, which we're going to look at more as we get through this book. Let me focus on this a little bit more carefully. There we go, look at this, very nicely done. And this is a long time ago, this is 1999. So this is 20, 23 years ago. So she's done lots and lots of different work since then. She likes chickens, yes, somebody said <laughs> she likes chickens, <laughs> whatever. She's got a huge backstory, super competent lady, super nice. Our worlds are a million miles apart, so I've only met her once or twice. She would be really nice to spend a lot more time with. Anyway, that's enough. Let's finish off with this. Today's Monday. I'll be back here now on Thursday, and you know what I am going to be doing. I am not going to sit here carving tonight this Yoshida print. I'm going to save this for the streams for the next little while. My priority work right now is very much different stuff. I've got to get to YouTube. So this block, you're going to see me pick up the knife on this block on Thursday morning, Wednesday for you, exactly the same place. I won't be doing any other work on it until I see you again. It's a frog, right? I didn't say gecko. I think it's a frog. It's a frog. It's a frog. It's a frog. She says so. It says Katsumi's frog. Katsumi is her husband. Her name he says Katsumi Shimizu, and uh, her name is Linita Shimizu. Okay, let me get out of here. Nice, beautiful blue sky. At the pool today, did I tell you, they had the, they had the roof opened, and I swam this morning underneath the open blue sky. It was so, so nice. Okay, time for coffee for me. I'll see you in a few days. Thank you very much. See you then. Signing off now. Bye for now.